Listen again when WDAF and your Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools present another school note. Stay tuned for the CBS Radio Mystery Theater following ABC News at the top of the hour. It's 11 o'clock. This is WDAF Kansas City. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is George Caldwell from New York. And at this hour, Vice President Gerald Ford says if the Senate Watergate Committee would reduce the size of its request for presidential documents, the White House might be willing to compromise. The committee is seeking hundreds of papers and tapes. Former Attorney General Elliot Richardson sides with President Nixon in his refusal. In McLean, Virginia, Richardson explains. I think the committee uh, seems to me to have... Uh cast its net too widely. They haven't, so far as I know, uh, made what I would regard as a sufficiently clear showing of why they wanted what they've asked for. And I think the president uh, is entitled at least to request that uh, they make such a showing before he produces any tapes or documents. Former Attorney General Elliot Richardson. Hope for changes in Arab oil policy. That story coming up. Drums. Drums. Are they drums for peace or war, dance or destruction? Like America drums or hate America drums? This is Martin Gable to tell you that you can help influence the beat. Young people in the developing countries of South America, of Africa, of Asia are eager to find out more about America, to understand our people and our ideas. You can help through Freedom House Books USA. Six dollars sends a packet of ten books to a young student, maybe a future prime minister, maybe a future doctor or teacher. He can choose from 120 books. Books on history, biography, science, and literature. The Russians send thousands of publications to him, but you, with your six dollars, can help inspire a love for freedom. Send your tax-deductible contribution to Freedom House Books USA, 20 West 40th Street, New York, New York, 10018. Energy Director William Simon says he's now hopeful Arab oil producers will not only end their price increases, but roll back oil prices. But Simon predicts even if the Arab embargo on U.S. shipments ends, American consumers still face shortages. An Egyptian official in Washington today defended the oil cutoff. Ambassador Ashraf Gorbal tells newsmen... Oil was meant only to ring a bell. Ring a bell wide and clear in every door in America and in the world. That we too are human beings. We too are suffering. And we have been suffering for the past 25 years. Garbal is to be the Egyptian ambassador to the U.S. when diplomatic relations are restored. Garbal was on the CBS program Face the Nation. Heavy rains have fallen throughout the day in Los Angeles. Forecasters predict more rain. It has set off mudslides, especially in the Topanga Canyon, 40 miles northwest of Los Angeles. However, there's one proposal for making good use of the weather. Correspondent Ann Kestner has details from Los Angeles. Here in California, there are those who are talking about tower power as an alternative during the energy crisis. The term refers to windmills atop towers on rooftops. Solomon Hagen, a young Guerneville, California businessman, is selling such windmills, which he imports from Australia. If the wind's blowing, the windmills, which cost $1,000 and up, can generate enough electricity to power homes much of the time. Extra power churned up by the wind generators can be stored in special batteries, good for three windless days. Ann Kessner, ABC News, Los Angeles. Eleven people were killed tonight at Johnstown, Pennsylvania, when an Allegheny commuter flight from Pittsburgh crashed just 100 feet short of a runway. The six survivors of Allegheny 317 are in critical condition. The co-pilot is among the survivors. The plane, a Beach 99, struck approach lights recently installed to aid pilots making landings in bad weather at Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Country and Western singer Tex Ritter was buried today at Port Neches, Texas. Ritter died of a heart attack Wednesday at age 67. This is Information Radio News. From the Kurt Murray Sports Desk, the Kansas City Omaha Kings hope to be hosts for the National Basketball Association All-Star Game in 1975 or 1977. If the Kings are successful, the game will be played in Kansas City. General Manager Joe Axelson says he hopes to trade dates with Milwaukee or Phoenix so the All-Star Contest can be played in the new sports complex. The arena is slated to open with the beginning of the 1974-75 basketball season. The Atlanta Flames of the National Hockey League acquired veteran center Brian Hextall today from the waiver list. He is the second Pittsburgh Penguin acquired by the Flames in the last few days. Earlier, the Flames traded for Al McDonough. 
Southwest Missouri captured the Missouri Intercollegiate Athletic Association basketball tournament crown by defeating previously unbeaten Lincoln University 80-75. to Dennis Hill and Randy Major each scored 21 points for the victorious Bears, while Lincoln center Lamont Pruitt had 30 points. Northwest Missouri took third place in the attorney with a 70-68 to triumph over the University of Missouri at Rollo. About 400 cheering, pennant-waving fans greeted the AFC champion Miami Dolphins today as they arrived in Houston to begin final drills for next Sunday's Super Bowl against Minnesota. As the crowd mounted uh, to await the Dolphins' arrival, security police tried to move people behind a chain-link fence, but at least one man was immovable. He was Howard Twilley Sr., father of Dolphin receiver Howard Twilley. The fireworks begin Saturday in the Big 8 Conference basketball race. All eight teams will be involved in their first family feuding of the 1973-74 campaign. The Kansas City forecast, fair and very cold for the rest of tonight. The low, 5 to 10 below zero. Mostly sunny and continued cold Monday, the high 10 to 15 degrees. Partly cloudy and not as cold Monday night and Tuesday. The low Monday night, 0 to 5 above. The high Tuesday, around 20. Currently, 4 degrees under mostly cloudy skies in Kansas City. This is Pat Ross, WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the Sound of Suspense... Welcome to the fear you can hear, but mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. In the story you're about to hear, the heroine is a young woman of 77 who has reached her golden years with her sense of independence intact, with a spryness to her limbs, very good vision, and excellent hearing. But as you are about to learn, there are times when hearing well is not a blessing. I did it, Mrs. Canby. Are you listening to me? I killed Richardson. Oh. I did it. Me. No, no, no. I don't want to hear it, Mr. Paulson. Please, please don't tell me about it. Please. <laughs> mystery drama, The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Agnes Moorhead. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K Cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. When you say but, you've said a lot of things nobody else can say. Why do some people think Bud is sort of special? Go ahead and find out why. Brewing beer right does make a difference. When you say Bud, you tell the world you know what makes it all the way. When you say Bud, you say it's all about the way you I guess you can hear the music in the background. It's now a quarter to eight. You know the piano player playing, and we're down the floor of the Waldo Astoria, and I'm going to talk to some people. Your name, sir? Viaggio County. Grandview, Missouri. Original from Bronx, New York. Oh. <laughs> Have you ever been to a dinner theater before? No, I haven't. How was the service? Wonderful. You look like you're enjoying yourself. I sure am. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the show. Now playing at Waldo Astoria, The Boyfriend. Call 756-1212. I guess you can hear the music in the background. It's now a quarter to eight. You hear the piano player playing, and we're down the floor of the Waldo Astoria, and I'm going to talk to some people. We have here what looks like a, a fun-loving table. What's your name? 
Pat Blue. Where are you from, Pat? Kansas City. From Kansas City. And uh, your first trip to the Waldo Astoria. What do you think of it? I think it's great. Have you ever been to Tiffany's Attic? Once. Did you like it? Yes. You plan on coming back? Yes, I sure do. Thank you. Now playing The Boyfriend. Call 756-1212. Here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. Huh? <laughs> the older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. <laughs> That's what my grandmother used to tell me. and She lived to be 98. Mm -mm. Uh, speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once a year visit. And he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Oh, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Mm, you're not? I decided to take in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. Won't let me do a thing for him, though. You know, where did you meet this, Mr. Paulson? Well, he answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. Oh, it's the friendliest sound. Well, I, uh, I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, either. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. Poor man hardly ever leaves his room. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. <laughs> oh, dear. Canby, I'm all right. <laughs> that cough sounds worse than ever to me. Why don't you let me fix you a little hot milk and honey? No, thank you, Mrs. Canby. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Well, all right, if you say so. I guess it's time I was in bed myself. <laughs> He keeps his birds awake, too. Mrs. Canby, please, please. For heaven's sake, is he, is he calling me? Mrs. Canby! He is calling me. I'm, I'm coming, Mr. Paulson. Oh, no. Where are those darn slippers? I'll be right there. What, what is it, Mr. Paulson? What's the matter? Mrs. Canby. Mr. Paulson, just look at you. Why didn't you tell me you were so sick? I would have called a doctor. No, no, too late now. Too late. I, I know a very good doctor. I saw him only this afternoon. I, I'll go and call him right no, now. No, please, listen to me. Well, I've got to get help for you, Mr. Paulson. I'm dying. I'm dying. Confession. Well, do, do you want a priest? Is, is that what you want? Richardson murdered ten years ago. What? Murder. I did it. I killed him for money. I was paid. Did you hear me? Oh, Lord. Uh, Mr. Paulson, do you know what you're saying? Do you understand me? Lindell is innocent. I killed Richardson, okay. not Lindell. Well, let, let me get help. Uh, you can tell 
problem yourself, Mr. Paulson, and the police and the doctor. Oh, tell them, please. Tell them to free Lindell. He's innocent. Tell them I'm the one who killed Richardson ten years ago. Oh, I don't know anything about such things, and I don't want to know. I did it. I killed Richardson. I did it. No, I don't. I don't want to hear it. I don't. Please don't tell me. Please. Mr. Paulson, I... I... Mr. Paulson? Oh, dear God, I, I think he's gone. <laughs> Listen to those poor little birdies. I suppose they miss poor Mr. Paulson. I'll lay them in his room. Well, let's see about this letter now. Dear Walter, I hope you don't mind my turning to you for advice, but I really don't know what to do. It's been three days since my boarder, Mr. Paulson, passed away, and I still haven't told the police what the man said to me. I just can't bring myself to get mixed up in anything like this. Uh, dear, what's the use of writing, Walter? You'll probably think I've dreamed it all up. No, I'll just forget it. Only how do you forget such a thing? Those names, I keep hearing them. Richardson, Lindell. Lindell is innocent. Oh, dear God, what if it's all true? If Mr. Paulson actually murdered this Richardson and Lindell is innocent, only, well, who are they? I wonder if a telephone book, well, well, why not? Let's see, Richardson, Richard, oh, I see, H-A-R-N. Yeah, yes, here it is. Oh, Lord, there's dozens of them. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen. Then D-L-D-E-L-L. Oh, oh, my heavens, Lindell and Richardson. Both names together, Lindell and Richardson Investments. Nine concourse, four one five three one three two. I wonder if... Well, maybe... Maybe it's the only way to be sure. speak to. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Hello. This is Mr. Chelton. May I be of service? Well, maybe you can. I, I want to know about your Mr. Richardson, uh, about when he died. I think I did business with him once uh, a long time ago. Well, it's ten years, madam, just about. But uh, if you're interested in investment advice... Well, I'll think about it. Thank you very much. Ten years. Well, it could be a coincidence. I guess it all depends on how he died. Well, Mrs. Canby, please come in. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, now, how can we be of help to you? I didn't come here to get help, Mr. Shelton. I came to help you, as a matter of fact. Or, rather, somebody you know. Who would that be? Uh, Mr. John Lindell, the man who was supposed to have murdered Mr. Richardson. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Well, it took me all week to find out what happened to those two men, and finally I found the story in the old newspaper room down at the library about Mr. Lindell being indicted for killing his partner. But I'm, I'm sure you know the whole story a lot better than I do. Well, of course I know the story, but <laughs> that was quite a long time ago, Mrs. Canby. Ten years doesn't seem so long when you're my age. Anyway, the point is that I can help your Mr. Lindell, only I can't do it alone. Did you know John Lindell? No, no, I didn't. Nor Mr. Richardson, for that matter. The man I knew was named Paulson. Who? I rented a room to Mr. Paulson, and he died about eight days ago of pneumonia. I was there when it happened. 
Well, that's unfortunate, but... Uh... Before he died, Mr. Paulson told me something about Mr. Richardson's murder. He said Mr. Lindell hadn't been responsible, that he, Mr. Paulson, had committed it for money. Oh, Mrs. Canby, listen to me. It was this man, Lindell, that bothered him. The fact that he was in prison for something he didn't do. I thought I should tell you this, Mr. Chelton, because you knew both of these gentlemen. It said so in the newspaper. Mrs. Canby, my, my dear woman. What? <laughs> I don't know what silly story you heard, but... It's completely wrong. There wasn't any question about what happened. This border of yours, whatever his name is, merely had an obsession. Well, just the same, I thought you could follow through on this business. Yeah. Tell the police. Because if it is true, Mr. Lindell should be freed. On evidence like that? I don't know anything about evidence. I'm just telling you what I heard. Well, never mind. I suppose I should have told the police myself. Wait, wait, Mrs. Canby. Uh, let me put your mind at rest. John Lindell is no longer in prison. He isn't? He's dead, Mrs. Canby. He's been dead for the last three years. Oh. He wasn't a young man when all this happened, when he accused his partner, Fred Richardson, of defrauding him and shot him dead. He died in prison? Even if all you say is true, that this man was Richardson's murderer, you can't help John Lindell any longer. He's beyond that. But his name, don't you want to clear his name? Have you any proof? Any living witness? Just myself. But you'd be willing to involve yourself? Start a whole new investigation? Open up the whole dreadful mess again? Mrs. Canby, do you know that John Lindell had a daughter? No. But wouldn't that be all the more reason to do something? His daughter's married, living in Minneapolis, a husband and three children. People have forgotten about her father by now. Would you want that poor woman to see his name dragged through the newspapers a second time? But if her father was innocent... Forget it, Mrs. Canby. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, well, it troubles me so. I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw a, a minister, if I had some advice from a man of God, maybe... Mrs. Canby, now you've said something. Now you've shown me the way. That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Miss Canby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please. Join me. Dear Lord, tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Stelton, I... Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to understand. Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. Do you? Well, I'm... Not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Miss Canby. Not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now. All of them. <laughs> yes? Uh, Mrs. Canby? Yes. My name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Canby. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would, uh, would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, uh, come on in, then. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it. I, I forget just who. Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Canby. Mm -hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. <laughs> And so Mrs. Canby has a new boarder. 
He is a very personable young man with a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. And now another tale of the ball and chain. Act Kellogg's Special K presents Pre Overweight on an Overnight Train. Is the seat taken? Please, sit down. Mm. You have exceptional legs. <laughs> uh, but why is one of them attached to a ball and chain? This ball and chain? It's a symbol. Funny, I would have sworn it was a ball and chain. I mean symbolic. Because carrying around a few extra pounds can be just like lugging around this ball and chain. I see. May I suggest something? Uh -huh. Try a bowl of Special K skim milk, orange juice, and coffee. It's the Special K breakfast. Will it make me lose weight? No. Oh. You must also exercise and eat smart at every meal. I see. Do you know the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and delicious? No, but if you hum a few bars... Oh, and that's another tale of the ball and chain. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. Good night. Take the time to listen. My grandmother just died. I'm so happy for you. Meet Mrs. McNulty. How do you do? And did you know you have spinach on your teeth? Oh, that's wonderful. This is Mr. Jackson. Nice to meet you. I have bubonic plague. Oh, yes, Mr. Plague. Meet Mrs. Reception lines aren't the only places people don't listen. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Stu Winfield took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed the crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago, the lace curtains on the window. He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeets. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these clean sheets on the bed. Mr. Here, Mr. let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Canby. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Well, listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Hmm? I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I, I think everything's great about this house. Uh, but there is something you can do for me. What's that? Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, that's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart. <laughs> Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in my house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He's a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson, and he seems to like nothing better than to sit around evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Hmm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Canby. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. Well, it's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific. No kidding. It, it tastes like, well, it... 
It tastes like home, if you know what I mean. Well, it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Mm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Oh, Excuse me. My steward, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffles. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra bottle. No, no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, you'll be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Uh, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. Uh, Paulson? Mm-hmm. Was that your former boarder, the, uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it, it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just the place for someone who came into a lot of money and, and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand this. Oh, my. Uh. I really think you are getting a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. Now, wait, Mrs. Canby. I'd rather hear well, about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Canby. Don't take any chances. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I bought your tray, Stuart. Oh. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Candy. It wasn't least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and starve a fever. That's what I mean, I was going to come out to the kitchen and... And get myself a sandwich or something. You didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> mm. I hope it tastes all right. And noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Canby, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I just thought it would be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. <coughs> Maybe watch television. Oh, that's good. Here, I'll just set this tray down. <laughs> oh, the service here is just too good. Oh, we <coughs> we never uh, we never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <coughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <coughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> all right, Mrs. Canby, I'll, I'll eat. Well, it happened just about three weeks ago. You know something, Mrs. Candy? That's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. Oh, I'm sure I spoiled your appetite with all my chatter. <laughs> no, no. That was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Hmm? Do you think I did the right thing? Well, frankly, Mrs. Candy, I do. Honestly? Well, this guy Chelton sounds a little screwy, but <coughs> I think he's all right. I mean, from a practical standpoint. Then you agree with him? Sure. This man Richardson's dead, right? And... What's his name, Lindell? Yes. Well, he's dead too, right? And poor Mr. Paulson, the man who supposedly killed Richardson. Well, there you are. <coughs> Nothing you can do will bring any of them back, right? Well, yes, but just the same. And you know the police, Mrs. Canby. They'll be hounding you forever. <coughs> Tracking mud into your parlor, bothering you with questions. No, Mrs. Canby, you're too nice a person to put up with that kind of thing. You mean too old a person? I just think Mr. Chelton was right. Let sleeping dogs lie. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but 
You know something? What? There's one thing Mr. Chelton forgot. And it was me, too, I suppose. What's that? Why, the real murderer. He may still be alive, even if all the others are gone. Don't you see? No, I... I don't. Even if Mr. Lindell can't be helped anymore, that doesn't mean the real murderer should get away. But the real murderer is dead. Paulson. No, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? Now, wait a minute. <coughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him, and then Paulson got cold feet, and Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you, you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <coughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this, this other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I... Uh, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. And Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm. And that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, <coughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Candy, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Well, it's nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And <coughs> <coughs> Listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. Just tell me. No, I'm, I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. Mr. Chelton, it's, it's me, Winfield. Well, what's happening? I, I think I'd better stick around for a few more days, Mr. Chelton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. <coughs> <coughs> Something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown. And as producer of Radio Mystery Theater, welcome to the premiere of an exciting venture in modern radio. The return of spine-tingling suspense and mystery seven times a week with fine actors and actresses and one other star player. Your imagination. We'd like to hear whether you're glad radio drama is back. So we're holding a weekly drawing for three weeks with 50 prizes a week. Two AM FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. All you do is send us your name and address to Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. Offer good everywhere unless locally prohibited. Our drama continues in one minute. Knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. But they advertised this chair for $50, and now they won't sell it to me. They're even trying to get me to buy one for $100. Isn't there anyone who can tell me what to do? 
I can, madam. But who are you? I am the man from the Better Business Bureau. And when someone advertises an item and then won't sell it to you when you come into the store and tries to get you to purchase something at a higher price, you may be the victim of a scheme known as bait and switch. Don't fall for it. In most places, it's illegal. Oh, sir, how can I ever thank you? No need to thank me, madam. That's what Better Business Bureaus are for. To help consumers get a fair deal. Mrs. Canby. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. Her border steward was right. She doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still... Oh, my... I'm just never going to get to sleep tonight. Poor Stuart. He's still coughing. I'm sure that room is just too drafty. We never should have let any boarders in until I got the windows fixed. Oh, dear. That poor boy. I'll never forget the terrible night Mr. Paulson was coughing so badly. Huh? And the way he looked, all gray and shrunken. If only I knew he was so sick. No. If only he'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I killed Richardson. I did it. No, I ever forget the sound of that man's voice. Lindell is innocent. Lindell is innocent. That poor man. All the years he spent in jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Canby. My Aunt Martha always said, let sleeping dogs lie. Oh, if only I could get some sleep. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. Canby. Not to the police. Not to the police. Not to the police. What a strange man he is, said Mr. Chelton. Where he talked about God praying at his desk. Of course, God is everywhere, but his desk. I killed Richardson. I murdered him for money. I was paid. I was paid. Paid? Paid. Someone had to pay him. Mr. Paulson wasn't the only guilty one. Someone else was, too. Hawkins. Hawkins. Oh, dear Lord, Mr. Shelton. Shelton. What did that newspaper article say? The chief witness against Mr. Lindell was Arnold Shelton. But how could he be a witness? Just something that never happened. How could he be? Oh, let me tell someone. I'll have to talk to someone. <laughs> Yes, I'll tell Stuart about it in the morning. Stuart, are you awake? Yes, I'm up, Mrs. Canby. Come in. Oh, oh no. Now, don't tell me I'm getting breakfast in bed, too. Well, I know you had a terrible night last night, Stuart. You were coughing much worse than ever. I guess that medicine wasn't very good. I'm sorry I kept you awake, Mrs. Candy. No, that wasn't your fault. No. Something else kept me up. What was that? Oh, my mind, I guess. Maybe I should say my conscience. Oh, that sounds serious. <laughs> well, it is something serious, Stuart. Well, I might have let a man get away with murder. No, it's even worse than that. He did something worse than murder. You're talking about Paulson again? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail. 
and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. Well, I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me, the reason he didn't want me to go to the police, was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Chelton had good reason, besides the one he told me. He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. <coughs> well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial, a witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? But that's just the point. He saw Mr. Lundell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. Is there was something about a phone call, maybe? Y yes, yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Canby, that's the big little word, isn't it? If. <laughs> but don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Shelton had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That lead the whole thing to him. All his customers, all the investments he handled, all the commissions, or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes. It's it's the only answer, Stuart. Well, look, if that was the case, the, <coughs> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Shelton. I don't suppose it even occurred to them. And now, the company is all his. Well, you don't, you don't call that evidence, do you? <laughs> well, then why didn't he let me go to the police? Why did he try so hard to talk me out of it? That man was praised to it. He was taking the name of the Lord in vain. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. Mrs. Candy. I won't wait. be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind You're... the doctor. Are you calling the police? No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't want them tracking mud in Moon Parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now, you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. Oh. <coughs> Sheldon. What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me at the office. It's an emergency. <laughs> you sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Sheldon, and how you did it. You fool. <laughs> You've got to stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Sheldon. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just <laughs> doubled. <laughs> old ladies are always having accidents. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. She's going to... She's going to have a fall down the cellar steps. Right now. <laughs> i got to get my robe on. My slippers. i I got to hurry. <laughs> Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Candy. For heaven's sake. <coughs> Stuart Winfield.
Dorothy. What are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I gotta, I gotta talk to you, Mrs. Canby, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Canby. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then I... I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Candy. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. You don't... You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now, think a little harder. You knew? <laughs> Stuart, you knew about Mr. Paul? That's right. That's how you knew my room was correct, because Mr. Uh... Chelton told you. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Canby. And that's why you rented it. That's why you were sent here. Just to watch you, Mrs. Canby. Just to see oh, that you yes. stayed sensible. Mr. Sensible. <laughs> Mr. Shelton did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Let me go. Let me go, Stuart. Just relax, oh, Mrs. Let Canby. Me go. Just take it easy. Stuart, please, please, don't. Oh, you're as light as a feather, Mrs. Candy. Just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I if I had an Aunt Martha. Please, stop, please let me go. Please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Candy. Let me go. Stop, Put up such a fight, Mrs. Candy. I'm sick, remember? Just shut your eyes, please. Shut your eyes and don't look down. Stuart, don't stand. Shut your eyes, old lady. Help me, Jeff. They'll all be old and good. They'll all be old and good. It's, uh, it's all right now, Ada. Just be glad that it wasn't you at the bottom of those stairs. Well, will he be all right, Dr. George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Truth is, his uh, injuries don't amount to very much. A couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his, uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chelton? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I don't understand. Stewart's injuries aren't serious. It's not the fall that made Winfield so sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? No, Yes, Nelson. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is. But this disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh, you get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Paulson's bird. Sorry, Ada, but... They had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. Hey, there's one reason I, I feel sorry for them. They saved your life. Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Parrot fever is so contagious that... No more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, Ada. We're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby, we can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beasts, and bird. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. This is Phyllis Diller. 
Playing comedy and being funny is my life. <laughs> now, when you hear my voice, you expect a joke and a laugh. But my kind of laughs and jokes are no help at all to a very special kind of people, mentally retarded children. You can help by being someone who cares, someone who will help. With help, with proper training, to stimulate his mind, and with love and patience, every single mentally retarded child can gain a better understanding of his world. But this takes a lot of work and so much time. It's a big job. Won't you help the people who are trying to get the job done? Your local association of the National Association for Retarded Children. Call them. We have one final comment for you. On behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying... There's no fool like an old fool. But it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You spoil me shamefully. <laughs> and that night, I spoiled her just a bit more by bringing hot cocoa to her in bed. Uh, I'll drink it down now. Does it taste all right? Oh, it tastes just fine. Now, that was very good news. Because I prepared the hot cocoa myself. And I had no idea whether 25 melted sleeping pills would seriously affect the flavor. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W-D-A-F, Kansas City.